Hello, I'm Hal Lublin. And I'm Mark Gagliardi. Since the dawn of humanity, one issue has gone unsettled. With the fate of the world in the balance, we're here to settle once and for all. Best song from Greece. That's right. Don't worry, everyone. We got this. Podcasts should have a theme song. Podcasts should not have a theme song. Yes, they should. No, they shouldn't. They sound good. Yeah, but people are just going to skip past it. Hmm. You know what? You're right. We got this. Hey there, Mark. What you do this summer? <laughs> what you what you do over at the beach, Mark? I am so sorry, Mr. Travolta. I was expecting Hal Lublin, who is normally my partner for We Got This, uh, to be here today. Sorry, but I flew in on my 747. Huh? Oh, oh, that's right. I forgot you're a pilot now. Congratulations. Well, it makes sense because you flew off in that car at the end of Greece. That was what started my love of aviation. <laughs> I well, was at the beach this summer, though, Mark. Did you meet a girl? <laughs> yes, I did, in fact, meet a girl this summer at the beach. I'm and it freezing. was. Uh... Can you get me a blanket? <laughs> That's why I sound like this, Mark. Summer's almost over. You sound like Casper the Friendly Ghost, the college years. <laughs> Mark, help me. I died as a child and I gotta register for classes. <laughs> If Casper the Friendly Ghost died roughly around the same time as leather helmets in football. <laughs> Hal, I don't know about you, but mm -hmm. I was a theater kid. We were both theater kids, right? Sure. I mean, yes. you made me yes. a, you made me a, uh, that, that meme generator once of the, when Straight Outta Compton came out and you made one of the two of us that said Straight Outta Theater Camp. So I'm going to guess that you know what I'm talking about when I say that Greece was instrumental in my childhood, specifically instrumental when it was played on the piano at every cast party for every musical we ever did, because <laughs> someone would sit down at the piano and play We Go Together and mm -hmm. the cast of whatever musical it was, be it mm -hmm. Fiddler or Music Man or The King and I, it did not matter. We stood around that piano and we sang songs from Greece. We still do it to this day at Marie's Crisis in New York. Yeah, there's nothing like a bunch of children dressed as turn of the 20th century Russian Jews singing uh, songs <laughs> from a musical yeah. about teenagers in the 1950s. Yeah. The, you just, know that, that like, if anything encapsulates what it means to be a theater kid or just involved <laughs> yeah. in the theater at all, it's that. Like, you can't scratch the, the, the itch will never be scratched. Like, you no. just did a show. You're feeling good. There's nothing like that feeling of like, like a high school show, just that you did it. Was the accomplishment, right? Like you're yeah. so excited. You spent 12 weeks rehearsing this thing that you yeah. did three times. And then, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you but did it for first... one weekend. Yeah. After two, working lucky. for 12 weeks on that show. We got two weekend runs at, at Abington Friends. So we what? Were, we're, that's, yeah. It was just by demand. I went to Farragut Nemesis, and none of the stars could get along long enough to do two weekends. <laughs> Isn't Farragut Nemesis the name of a starship in? <laughs> yes, it <laughs> is. Con. Exactly. Uh, you've never seen Greece until you've seen it in the original Klingon. <laughs> Rama -lama -lama -ka -ding -a -ding -a -dong. Weirdly, Rama -lama -ka -ding -a -ding -a -dong is the only thing that translates. Universal language. Right. This topic was actually suggested two years ago mm -hmm. by Sean Casey, and it is sadly relevant now because we just lost Olivia Newton-John. We did. Who somehow, she was always Olivia, like no matter what stage of her life she was in, she always looked like Sandy. She always looked... Uh, like her character from Xanadu, whose name is escaping me. She like she just always she was always Olivia Newton John. She was like always herself. Yeah. She was this like figure apart from everything, amazingly talented. And what is she better known for than Greece? It's like it was like the number one thing that she did in a career full of wonderful things. Not like the only thing, but it is the thing that she'll be associated with for the rest of time. Yes. But she also, outside of Greece, I don't want to, you know, sell short her mm -hmm. career outside of this. By the time Greece was released, she already had a greatest hits album out. So she was already a well established star by the time Greece came out, which, by the way, if we're talking about timing, Hal, Greece coming out in theater form in 72 and film form in 76. 78. 78, sorry. Yeah. 
would be the equivalent of someone now. Like, it feels like such a period piece because we were doing it in the 90s. It was a play from the 70s about the 50s. So it mm-hmm. felt like such a time warp of a show. That would be the equivalent of doing a show now that took place in roughly 2002. <laughs> hey, did anybody text you on your sidekick this summer? <laughs> it is like, I mean, the 70s was, we're always on a wave of n- nostalgia. Yeah. And it generally is on a 20 year lag. So the 70s was the time of the 50s. So you had happy days. You had Greece. Then in mm-hmm. the 80s, we got back into the 60s. So the monkeys come again. Sure. Like, we had a uh, dress like a hippie dance party in mm-hmm. like the seventh grade. Mm hmm. Yeah. Even like into the late 80s, early 90s, which was like the Doors period, the Doors became mm-hmm. popular again. And then Oliver Stone makes the Doors movie in 92. So Greece is. And like, 92 is popular now yes. with uh, everybody wearing the, uh, the white tube socks. And also, I would be weird not to talk about, even though American Graffiti takes place in 1962, it also feels mm-hmm. like a love letter to the car culture of the late 50s and early 60s mm-hmm. in Modesto, where George Lucas is from. But the, like Greece is maybe the biggest piece of 50s nostalgia that lives on to this day because it's a show that kids do in high school nobody's doing happy days the play maybe they should they have done happy days the musical it got a really good national tour yeah it was a big deal but this feels like yeah the original nostalgia piece Mm -hmm. this is the original version of every town that has a 50s diner that has that swinging legs elvis clock and the little tiny jukeboxes on every table. I mean, it's that quintessential 1950s. It's the reason that as kids in Kids Unlimited in Knoxville, Tennessee, the boys were slicking their hair back and putting fake cigarette packs in our T-shirt sleeves. And the girls were wearing poodle skirts as we did our medley. I've never done the actual show Grease, yeah. but I have done a medley from Grease multiple times in my life. It's an infinitely medleyable show. I feel like outside of doing Oliver Mm -hmm. in seventh grade and in sixth grade, the musical was Little Shop, which I did not do. I was not auditioning. I was too shy to audition at that point. We never did a a lot of the the choices for shows that we did were like as far removed from Greece as possible. Like my senior year, we did the apple tree, which a lot of people you have to like really know Broadway to know the apple tree. Mm -hmm. So Greece was always like. Not that I turned my nose up at popular musicals. I just wasn't as versed in them. I knew Summer Nights. Like, I knew of it. I knew it. I was familiar enough with it. But it, like, for you, I told you this over text, and I'll say it now so it's recorded Mm -hmm. for all history, that it's, like, the perfect show for you. Like, you'd be a great Danny Zuko. You'd be a great Kaniki. Like, those are two two great roles. You'd be a great uh, teen angel. You'd be a great teen angel. You would, there's a, there's a lot, like, it, it's, it's one of those shows that has all these iconic standout roles. I, yeah, I remember there was a time when I was a teenager in my early twenties, I thought, these are the roles I want to play. I want to play either Kanicki or Danny yeah. or Burger and Hare. Like, all of these sort of, like, iconic male swagger roles of that era that are just a heck of a lot of fun. Yeah. But I never did play. Danny in Greece. My school never did Greece in the time I was there. They did it the year after I left. The theater company I got involved with in my early 20s in LA, they did it the year before I got there. What theater group in LA? Young Actors Company. The ones, the ones I did oh, Fiddler with out here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. When I first moved here. Great yeah. group. Great group. But yeah, this is one of those. And this show is the play. It's funny. We're going to talk specifically, I think, about the movie soundtrack because this is in honor of Olivia Newton John, who was not in the original play. Mm-hmm. But there are like the play is a little tougher. The play plays a little darker. It's a little grittier. The movie paints this beautiful, idyllic version of the 1950s. Mm-hmm. The play does as well, but it also gets pretty raunchy. You know, there are moments in it, mooning being one. Mm-hmm. You know, there there are songs in it that are that everybody bears their ass at the end of the song. Of course, it's mooning. That's what the song is. You've got the lyrics to Grease Lightning. She wasn't always a dragon wagon. That version of Greece is the more down and dirty pre movie version. But what we're going to talk about is the polished 1978, uh, the album released in April, the movie released in June. Yeah. PG. And we're going to talk about these specifically because there are a lot of great songs that were written for this movie. So when we talk about the best song from Greece, I don't think that song is going to be all choked up from the original musical. It's going to be something from this soundtrack. And I'm going to go ahead and argue, if we want to just jump right in, I'm going to go ahead and argue that it's going to be something off of 
the first side of this double LP. Oh, okay. Because they front loaded. Did you know this? They front loaded the album. The song, You're the One That I Want, happens at the end of the movie, as we know. Okay. But if you look at the 24 tracks that are on this album, the first side. So, you know, record number one, side A, Mm -hmm. is the opening song, Grease, sung by Frankie Valli, created for the movie. Then you've got Grease, the opening number for Mm -hmm. the show, not in the original. Frankie Valli, big star, sings it. Then... Summer Nights, Hopelessly Devoted to You, You're the One That I Want, and Sandy. They just front load all of the Olivia and John, and then the rest of the album plays out mostly in chronological order from the movie. Yeah, it's a lot of, I mean, side two, you have Beauty School Dropout, you have Look at Me, I'm Sandra D, and you have Grease Lightning, which are probably the three biggest. If you were going to cram three more on the side A, those mm-hmm. would be the ones you would put sure. there. Well, and we go together. And, and, yes. And a lot of the tracks on it, the reason why it's a double album is it's got a lot of music from the fifties performed, mm-hmm. uh, by and large by Shanana. So, Sha- yeah. So Shanana, it's, there's basically three different parts to this album that we're looking at today. And I would argue that we might be able to just eliminate two of them. But the first one is the songs that are sung by the main characters, Danny, Sandy, Rizzo, Teen Angel, and, and that crew. Then you've got the songs that were background music in the show, which is the songs that's on the jukeboxes. And that's mostly Louis St. Louis or Louis St. Louis. I don't know how you pronounce it. And Cindy Bolins, who the two of them did all of the jukebox songs, many of which were songs that were originally sung by characters in the movie or in the play. The character Roger in the musical sings, you know, Kenicki was the original one that sang Grease Lightning. But these songs from the movie, uh, Frenchie had Freddie My Love. I think it was Frenchie. One of the other women uh, had Freddie My Love. So these songs become jukebox songs. Then you have Shana Na, which was the live band that played the dance. And in the Shana Na section, that's where you've got Blue Moon, Rock and Roll is Here to Stay, Those Magic Changes, Hound Dog, Born to Hand Jive, and Tears on My Pillow. Right. So those are the three sections. You have the jukebox, the big dance, and then this uh, Broadway musical songs. I think you're probably going to agree with me that we're going to the winner of this episode is probably going to be a song sung by one of the main characters in the show. Yes. I think there are not that many contenders. Okay. So Shanana has gone. Shanana has gone, but I would like to give a shout out to look. Shanana did a great, a bunch of great cover songs and they did those magic changes from the original show, but their version of born to hand jive. That huge production number in the gym, the now can you hand job, baby, when that kicks in toward the end, it's got that great buildup. It's got a great dance break in the middle. And it does that thing that a lot of great songs do that I love where the dance break just builds and builds and builds and builds until the entire cast of the movie, the janitor, the, uh, the, every patron of the restaurant, people in off the streets, the cooks, the everybody is singing the and dead. the whole thing is just a giant. The dead they have rise risen out of their graves. Yeah, I just love a big over the top production number. Where do you think the idea for Thriller came from? It's from all those dead bodies doing the hand drive in the <laughs> motion picture adaptation of Grease. Shame that it just sounded like loose flapping so much of it because all of those body parts were just kind of hanging on by a thread. There were a lot of fingers on the ground when that was over. Well, look, it was all, all of those zombies were from the science lab explosion. By the way, doesn't Loose Fingers sound like a band from the seventies who like everybody had at least one Loose Fingers album? Oh, of course. Look, not everybody owned a Loose Fingers album, but everybody that owned a Loose Fingers album started a band. Of course. Yeah. yeah. I mean, listen, when I heard Loose Change for the first time, it, it was life altering. See, there you go. You know what band came out of, uh, Loose Fingers in this whole story? Hmm. The zombies. Well, I guess we're going to retire. We can't top that. (laughs) Shut up. That's it. We didn't even make it out of season one. (laughs) So if you look at the soundtrack Mm -hmm. to Greece, yes, there's something that I notice since we're, it's fun. I kind of like an episode where we're usually, you know, a lot of times we do things that are so broad. This topic is so narrowly focused on one album. So we're going to really take a look at this album. And part of that is, you know, you look at the liner notes of an album where you look at the reverse cover, which has all the tracks listed on. That's how you can see that, you know, side one is so front loaded on this. Mm -hmm. And the names that you see a lot are Jacobs and Casey. 
Jacobs and Casey were the two that wrote the original 1972 stage musical that premiered, I believe, before it was on Broadway. It was in Chicago. I don't know if it was at Kingston Mines. I think it was Kingston Mines on the north side. Right. And I remember this from college because you know how everybody, not everybody has, but everybody knows somebody who has that the one that got away story. Mm -hmm. Well, the one that got away for my college roommate's dad was owning one third of the Grease Empire when it was a teeny little show that was just playing Kingston Mines in Chicago. And they're like, hey, do you want to go thirds on this show with us? We only need like 1500 bucks to put it up. Wow. So yeah, for about $500, he would own one third of this empire. You know, you've seen Defending Your Life, right? The Albert Brooks Oh, movie. yeah. Sure. When he's in the seventies, when he's meeting his friends, like, do you want to get in on Seiko? They're going to start making watches. He's like, the Japanese don't make watches. They make transistor radios. <laughs> and then he loses out like it yeah. was worth a ton of money. Just that moment, which everybody, look, everybody of was course. alive when Apple stock first went public and they could have bought it. Like there are a lot of things we all could have bought, but that is a very yeah. specific. Oh, you want to get in on Greece? No, I don't know. I'd rather have this $500 to, I mean, I'm sure I bet. That he can't remember what he did with that five hundred dollars that wasn't putting it up for Greece. Yeah, no, no, but uh, yeah, the, the only you know what that five hundred dollars is? That five hundred dollars is not Greece. That's what he bought with that. What did he buy with that? He bought not Greece. He, he went bought, to the store and he bought five hundred one dollar not Greases. Maybe he bought five one hundred dollar not Greases. But whatever he bought, he has a full cabinet of not Greases now, and he'll never run out of it. And he will never run out of not greases. But another thing that I noticed on this album art, aside from the names Jacob and Casey, the two guys that wrote the original musical, mm -hmm. is Jay Ferrer. And that is John Ferrer, who wrote two of the tracks for the show. John Ferrer wrote, You're the One That I Want, mm -hmm. and Hopelessly Devoted to You. John Ferrer had nothing to do with the original Grease. He was, however, Olivia Newton-John's personal guy. So she brought him in. He wrote two songs for the show, and they've arguably become two of the five or so most iconic songs from this show. Yeah. I mean, obviously, she knew how to surround herself with very good people. Yeah. How do you want to go about this? Because these songs are like they all share a definite DNA. So how do you separate them? Some of them are slow songs. Some of them are really great duets. Some of them are really energetic cast numbers mm -hmm. what kind of criteria can we use that will allow us as we always do to in a completely objective way determine what the best track is on this album well i think that as far as breaking them down we can look into the little sections that i mentioned before the uh the songs that the characters sing the songs from the dance and the songs on the jukebox we can further probably break down the songs that the characters sing into maybe john ferris songs and jacobs and casey songs we could break it down like that. But you did mention something just now that I would like to dive into first, which mm -hmm. is what are our criteria? What is going to make our best song the best song? And I think to do that, we need to step back and look at a musical itself. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. you had there are certain things that a musical has to have. It has to have an I want song from the leads. It has to have a great big production dance number. I would argue that it's got to have a minor character, like a quick deep dive into a minor character, which this show has one of my favorite versions of. Mm -hmm. BD School Dropout? No, but and that feels like a fun outlier song because it's this fantasy sequence. The one I was thinking of was There Are Worse Things I Could Do, mm -hmm. which it turns out was from the original musical. Stock, they were going to cut it from the movie, but Stockard Channing was like, please, I'm one dimensional. Rizzo is completely one dimensional if she doesn't get this song. So they left the song in there. Wow. I actually saw it on Broadway with Brooke Shields as Rizzo and Rosie O'Donnell. I saw that production twice. Anyway, been great. she was great. Let's take a quick break and then we're going to really dive into these songs. How's that sound? That sounds great. And while we're on this break, I want you to think about something. We're oh, not okay. discussing it here. We're not putting it up against Greece at all. But Xanadu, while it is not a good film, is probably her second most well-known cinematic work. And that soundtrack is great. Because half of it is an Olivia Newton-John album written by John Ferrer. And the other half is an ELO album written entirely by Jeff Lynne. So just think about that. Listen to that soundtrack, too, to enjoy more of Olivia Newton-John's work. And also listen to some of the other fun shows that you're about to hear about 
on this wonderful network. We'll be right back. The word. Hi, everyone. I'm Anna McLeod. And I'm Alexis B. Preston. And we host a show called Comfort Creatures, the show for every animal lover, be it a creature of scales, six legs, fur, feathers, or fiction. Comfort Creatures is a show for people who prefer their friends to have paws instead of hands. Unless they are raccoon hands, that is okay. That is absolutely okay, yeah. Yes. Every Thursday, we will be talking to guests about their pets, learning about pets in history, art, and even fiction. Plus, we'll discover differences between pet ownership across the pond. It's going to be a hoot on Maximum Fun. Hi, everybody. My name is Justin McElroy. And I'm Sydney McElroy. Dr. Sydney McElroy. That, that is true. It's important in this context because we host a medical history podcast called Sawbones. Oh, I thought we were going to. We should have worked on that. Sawbones. Sawbones isn't afraid to ask the hard-hitting questions. Like, are vaccines as safe and reliable as they want us to believe? Yes. Do I have to get a flu shot? Yes. Uh, okay. Is science a miracle? No. We have a lot of great history for you and a lot of laughs. And sometimes the history is so bad that there's no laughs, but... You'll learn something, you'll feel something. And it's always Sawbones. That's right. Every week on MaximumFun.org. All right, Hal. Let's dive into some of these songs and let's breeze through big swaths of them to get to the really good stuff that we know we want to talk about. So let's start with the Bullums and St. Louis numbers. These are the songs that were in the original musical, but were given to these two musicians to turn into jukebox songs that are playing in assorted scenes throughout. That is, of course, the now instrumental version of Alone at the Drive-In Movie. It's raining on prom night, Freddie My Love, Mooning, and uh, Rock and Roll Party Queen. Some great tunes. There's a reason that those were all relegated to the jukebox in the movie, though. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, we can, we can eliminate those whole cloth. Everybody knows, you know, we know what we're circling, but go ahead. We'll, we'll for the yeah. formality of it. Let's we know what we're circling for the formality's sake. Now let's look at the Shauna Na songs, the songs from the dance. And I would argue there's one great one that we talked about a little bit earlier. And that is, of course, Born to Hand Jive. Born to Hand Jive. But it also is maybe not like a, it's, it's a good like B tier if the yeah. other songs are A tier. So it's, I think it's the most fun dancing, but like lyrically as a piece in a musical, it sort of stands aside. It doesn't really forward the characters. It doesn't really move the plot. It doesn't do a lot aside from have a really good dance number. And also the lead singer of Sha Na Na in that particular song, mm-hmm. his voice could not sound more swingery Tom Jones. Well, in your hands, oh, baby. The way he's singing, it sounds like he's trying to sleep with the students. And this is a high school dance, sir. I mean, look, he was at Woodstock. Put those hips him. away. That's true. Sean and I was at Woodstock. They were at Woodstock. <laughs> Holy crap. What were these guys doing? I don't know their they story did, at all. They did the hop. That was one of the songs they did. The at hop. the hop, do, do. That, yeah. like, classic? Yeah. Oh, okay. On what sounded like poorly tuned instruments. But yes, uh, yeah. Shana Na, we can eliminate. We all know the hand jive too, but I feel like yeah. what we probably know the hand jive better than the song because everybody knows the hand. Like I couldn't, sure, I could not sing the hand jive, but I go, I can do it. I just yeah. did it. I just, you know, what's funny about the hand for those who don't know, it's uh, two each of slap your legs, clap your hands, clap, yeah. right over left, left over right. Uh, thumb over right shoulder, thumb over left shoulder. We have to do the, you do the, you oh, do the yeah. Pat, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Pat, that's right. Clap, clap. Pat your legs, clap, clap. Potato, potato. Hand no, no, over no, no, hands, no. It goes, it goes hands. hand over hand, hand over hand, then potato, then potato. Then potato, potato and then thumb. Then, thumb. Pa- then hitchhike, rock beats hitchhike. rock, rock beats rock, hitchhike, yeah, yeah. hitchhike. Hitchhike, yeah. hitchhike. Thank you. We sound like Adam Rose on uh, TikTok right now <laughs> with his dance videos. <laughs> Wash the lamb. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Drive the car, don't go far. <laughs> and spit. But yeah, you know, it's funny. I, and I think it's because we did it. I think we did the hand drive in our medley in Kids Unlimited during a completely different song, Why which not? was We Go Together. We used to do that. It fits. We did that. We used to do the hand drive during We Go Together. And I, I never connected that there's a hand drive song in the show. Like during the, the doo part, like the bit of a bit of a bit of a doo bop bop. Ramma, lamma, lamma, da ding, da ding, da dong, shoo bop, shoo wada wada, yip, bitty, boom, da boom. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was your lyric? What was your lyric that you used to sing? 
oh from we go together the uh mm-hmm. it goes ting tang harry orangutan that's the way that's it the way be. it should be Whoa, Whoa, yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah so this song is great this song is from the original musical it is the big closing number not closing number because they had uh, all choked up which is what um you know what's it called replaced the one that I want, but we go together is the big showstopper. Like if doing a musical in high school was all about the camaraderie of it, mm-hmm. then we go together is all the theater kids in the school just living their absolute best life. Yeah, this is the, this yeah, is the song I mean, that, this that is, ends with a car ride to heaven, isn't it? Uh, can't, yeah, can't top that car ride to heaven. That was the Loose Fingers. That was their number one hit. It was their first one. It was Car Ride to Heaven. Yeah. You know who covered that? Mm. The Zombies. Again, season one cut just <laughs> short. <laughs> yeah, it's a great number. I think it's on the Mount Rushmore. I think we have to leave it in contention. They mm-hmm. fly a car. Off. It's John Travolta's first experience as a pilot. I got to stop using it's the Mount Rushmore for this because that is a problematic uh, use of Lakota land. Yeah. It's on a podium that has maybe at least three places. How about that? Part of the fantastic. We're going to have gold, silver, bronze, uh, wood, and construction paper. It's in the Pantheon. There we go. All right. That's one of the big ones. It tells this as far as storytelling goes, it's all of the cast together. It's using fun nonsense words like famous 1950s songs did. It even throws in Witch Doctor and Who Put the Bomb into the song, little snippets of it at the end there. And it uses the vernacular of the day to get the final words out of the characters, which is we go together like Ramalama Lama a Ding a Ding a Dong. Well, let's bookend that. I'll put another one in the Pantheon, which is Summer Nights, which in addition to being sort of a great introduction to the premise of their romance, with mm-hmm. one another is eminently singable. It is like a stand, it has become a karaoke standard, which isn't really a criteria, but just like shows the extent to which it kind of has elevated out of the musical. I mean, yeah. it still fits very much a part of it. It's not like it, like sure. it doesn't exist very importantly within the musical, but it, it's you know, all of the expositions. Yeah. Gives you the characters. It shows you that idea of the he said, she said of just everything. So there's something mm-hmm. identifiable about it. It's simple. The mm-hmm. music of it is very simple. The singing of it is really what elevates it. And that's at I the end kind of what specifically. I like yeah. But a lot of it is, you know, the driving piece of music in it is that do, 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 stresses that out. The drums, the yeah. guitar, any other music piece is dressing up around the bass, which is simple and allows the singers to sort of, I think the, the vocalists are kind of driving. They're putting all the flowers out like they're making it real pretty and memorable. And all of them are doing that. It's not just Danny and Sandy. Mm -hmm. It's everybody gets a moment in that. Even, you know, Sonny gets his, can she get me a friend? Mm -hmm. And Rizzo has her because it sounds like a drag. Like it's just it's the every character that they want to introduce in this song is introduced perfectly. They introduce the way the boys think, the way the girls think. They split off into these duets. They mm-hmm. come together beautifully. Even the different parts that the backup singers sing when they come together and their their music meshes together. Yes. It is yeah, and it uh this is the song when we went in. This, to me, was the song that was, I think this is the one to beat. I think this is a nearly perfect musical theater song. It sets everything up. It's fun to sing. And if We Go Together is the high school theater kids living their best life, Mm. Summer Nights is the high school theater kids putting on their best show. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's a great song. It's really, really well performed, especially since we're taking it from the movie. You have to go from the movie performances. And that bit of harmonizing at the end that Olivia Newton John and John Travolta do, where he's actually above her in oh, pitch, it's perfect. is yeah. really, really great. And hearing them do it at one of the anniversary like interviews and how happy, like how happy he seemed to be doing like harmonizing like that with her. Yeah. Like just having that moment. Like he's so proud of it. And, and she's always just she's always just it was effervescent and seemed so happy and like just thrilled to be there. Her voice makes everything sound so easy. Just the yes. lightness. 
Yes. She never sounds like, even when she's belting notes at the end with her reprise of Look at Me, I'm Sandra D. Yeah. Which she only does a little bit in the show, but even then there's still that lightness to it. Yeah. And I'd say if, you know, if this is, this could be kind of fun. If we could just, if we could play King of the Mountain with this one, we had, we go together as King of the Mountain, but then Summer Nights just came in and I think Summer Nights kicked, we go together off of the mountain as the king. What do you think? Or the monarch of the mountain. That's more alliterative. Yeah, I think so. I think that's All the right. head of the pantheon sitting atop Mount Olympus. Is very well, sitting great. atop Mount Olympus in the big seat right now is Summer Nights. Who is going to challenge for the mantle of the greatest song? I would argue that they're really, there's some, look, there's some other great songs in the show. Look at me. I'm Sandra D. I was about to do a bit. What? After you said that, I was going to go, I will challenge, sir. <laughs> oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> Please step asked, right up here. You asked what my name is, like you're the emperor, remember? And I'm like stepping up. Oh, yes. And w- what is your name? <laughs> this is how we do all our improvising. Hold this on. is how we improvise all our bits. Hal just gives me my <laughs> next line. Say, Clearly, <laughs> he is referencing something that I have no idea what he's referencing. I thought it was Black I'm Panther, not, but you did just, not do a Wakandan no, accent. No, I, no, that, that's not happening. Uh, <laughs> I didn't do like a child. I, it was like when I would play with my Star Wars figures and my parents would want to be involved. I'd be like, Oh, mm-hmm. this is great. Cause I'm an only child. And then they would yeah. come in and they would do it wrong. They know the voices <laughs> and they would put them in the wrong place. Like, no, that's not how you do it. You do it. That's this way. not where it goes. So here we'll, we'll you, do oh, it. You guys, you, people of the world, you should see some of our improv shows. He physically just moves me where he wants me on stage. I know. And then you improvise circles around me. <laughs> and then he keeps putting me back in that spot. Yeah. <laughs> no, you sit here. Wait, I'll pull a chair. All right. Ready? So you'd be like, who? Remember, you're like, who will, and who, who, who is challenging? I mean, be excited about it though. Oh, who is challenging this song for supremacy? I do, sir. And what is your name? You're the one that I want. I beg your pardon. You are the one I want. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Honey, is that you? I think this is almost a better bookend for summer nights. Like summer nights feels like the opposite of we go together, but mm-hmm. really the opposite of it is you're the one that I want where they've switched. Now they've switched the roles yeah. that they had in summer nights and also has great harmonizing in it. And it's fun to see them do it in the different fair rides here. I do look, I love that number when they walk through the fun house and they're yeah. in the spinny circle room and they're, and that's that there's that one long shot. It's just beautiful the the scene is beautiful Mm -hmm. i disagree about the song though and i think it's because of the writers i think that casey and jacobs having written both summer nights and we to go together those songs fit together a little better lyrically and i realize that they've they've, 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 they they flip that yes they're stories of flip but and it's the same problem i'll jump right into with uh hopelessly devoted to you it's the same problem that I have, which is they're both. Gr- I mean, hopelessly devoted to you is a beautiful song. They they nail that fifty style. You're the one that I want is a great song, but I think lyrically, I think hopelessly devoted to you is a little more within the story. Uh, you're the one that I want doesn't really tell me all that much, except the verses just expand on you being the one that I want. I've got chills. They're multiplying. I'm losing control because the power you're supplying is electrifying. I also like you. Here's the chorus. Here's another verse about me liking you. Hey, you better like me a lot. Do you like me? Wow. You know what I mean? Yeah. Did you know, by the way, that that, that song, Hopelessly mm-hmm. Devoted to You, which had a resurgence on TikTok with that weird, like, somebody did like a vocoder version of it and they went all of course they it became a very popular sound the song was nominated for best original song yeah at the oscars losing to do you know what it lost to last dance <laughs> last dance tonight no look i I don't disagree that it's i i think hopelessly i think you're the one that i want is a really fun song i don't think it's a mm-hmm. great song Okay. But Hopelessly Devoted to You is a great song, though, with the Oscars, they have whatever the new song is, is the only one that's eligible. None of these other songs would have been eligible for an Oscar because they were already in the musical. Mm -hmm. But yeah, what do you think of Hopelessly Devoted to You? 
I think it's a a really well written song. I think her performance of it is so good. Like you said, she makes it seem easy, but at the same mm-hmm. time, you listen to that and you go like, oh, I can't do that. There aren't a lot of people that can do that. Like, no, the most talented singers in the world can't pull off that particular sound. There's something. Sure. Well, she her. also has her guy doing it. You know what I mean? Well, uh, there's that, but it's also John Farrer yeah. writing a song specifically sure. for her voice. Sure. And showing it off. And for that reason, but it is a song, I think, that I would imagine were I playing Sandy in Greece, mm-hmm. that would be the song I would be most excited to perform because that's the that's oh, yeah. moment to shine. That's and the showstopper. It's a great I want song. Mm-hmm. And just like the performance of it is unreal. It's, it's hard to beat Summer Nights because Summer Nights is pretty much the whole main teenage cast. Yeah, I guess it's. Hopelessly, and, and this is, I think this is the problem I'm having with it. And it's mm. not that I'm just not liking John Ferrer's songs that he put into this. That seems like it. I, no, I do. I like, I love you. I mean, I've, I've loved this album and I've listened to it a million times my entire life. But you skip all the John Ferrer. I skip all the John Ferrer songs. Uh, no, it feels like if you are a show in a musical, mm-hmm. you've got to do something, right? And I think that Summer Nights, put very simply, Summer Nights accomplishes more than Hopelessly Devoted to You does and You're the One That I Want does. It's not that those songs are bad. It's that Summer Nights is pretty perfect. Wouldn't you it say sets up everything. Wouldn't you say it's almost the only song in this group that does, that really like contributes majorly to the plot? As opposed to everything else is just sort of describing what's already going on because some yeah. of is the one that tells the story that really like kicks the whole thing off. Like, yeah. here's what happened. Now I'm going to take it back. We each have our own version of the story. You can see not only that they love one another, but that there are massive differences between them that they both mm-hmm. saw their encounter differently. And that for, at least for Danny, his need to say face and look cool in front of his buddies. Yeah. Is getting in the way of him being able to properly be in the relationship because oh. like every high schooler, he's concerned with how everything looks and how cool he is. When he yeah, walks off that. at the end of the song mm-hmm. to have that moment, you know, there, there's that, they're together and he's like, uh, we made out under the dock. And then not half a verse later, it's wonder what she's doing now real mm-hmm. pensively off on the side. It is. Yeah. It gets across so, so much. And I think there are, there is hardly a theater person in this country who, if they hear, dum, da, dum, da, dum, da, 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 played on a piano, will not run to pick a side because you know sides are forming if there are other theater people in that room with you. Sides are forming. People are bending over and snapping. You pick which side you want to be on for this number and you do your do do do's. Do you get to do your do do do's? Don't forget to do your do do do's. Look, man, I did you listen for your homework assignment today, class. We're doing do 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 do's. Okay. I just want to give shout out to, uh, before we wrap things up, because uh-huh. it sounds like we've got like potentially it. our winner. I don't know if anybody can kick this off. Look at me. I'm Sandra D. Stockard Channing crushes that song. Love it. And Olivia Newton-John crushes the reprise at the end, brings it back around, gives Sandy her I know what I have to do moment, and it's beautiful. Found this out today. Mm-hmm. On the, Do you know what day it was when they recorded that song, which includes the lyric, Elvis, Elvis, let me be. Keep that pelvis far from me. I assume it's the day that he passed away. August 16th, 1977, 45 years ago, a couple of days ago. Wow. Yeah. Wild, right? Yeah. That is. Anyway, insane. look, there is a, there is a perfect song from this show. There is. I would give a brief shout out to Grease Lightning, which I love the energy of. And I feel like we all saw all know the, whoa, Grease Lightning. Oh, the oh, dance over is great. I didn't mean yeah, to I mean, not mention that, but I was thinking so much about Olivia. And it also has the clap. Isn't it also the one with the, yeah. Dun, 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 dun. Oh no no that's in uh wait is that in Grease Lightning or is that Oh yeah it is. Go yeah. Grease Lightning. It's such oh, yeah. a great energy. Number. It's a great tune. 
Kanicki's originally given to Danny because it's John Travolta and he's better singer than Jeff Conway. I guess. <laughs> it's Jeff Conway. May he, you know, all of us shall rest live. in peace. Yes. yes. May his memory be a blessing. May Olivia Newton John's memory be a blessing. And one way you can honor her memory, people of the world, is to watch Xanadu. And then after you cleanse your eyes and thank your ears, you can enjoy Greece and you will thank your eyes and your ears for the experience. And it's such a great, I mean, it's a four sided soundtrack. That's how much great music is in it, both original and re-recorded classics that help really uh, firmly set it in its time period. But the winner of this episode, which should be no surprise to anybody, is the song we all know at least a part of. And the one that does the best job and the most heavy lifting of any song in that show in terms of what it sets up how it sets the characters up, how it sets the conflict up, and how inclusive it is of the cast. I think that's another important thing, too. It is a big cast number that has these big moments of energy and all these laughs, but all these also all these really small moments, not small moments, but all these isolated moments of character where we get to see the real Danny and the real Sandy and the connection that they have. And that helps carry us through the entirety of the show. If we don't have summer nights, then you're the one that I want doesn't really matter. We go together doesn't matter as much. Everything that happens after that doesn't matter as much because we don't know whether these characters belong together or not. And because of summer nights, we do know. And for that reason, and we miss you, Olivia Newton-John. And as with every person who has left a body of work behind, we don't know them personally. We know our memory of them. And a way to honor that memory and to keep it alive is to enjoy this huge body of work that has been left behind. So you're never far away from the artists you admire who are no longer with us. We love you, Olivia Newton-John. We hope you rest in peace. Your memory will always be a blessing to us. Thank you for your performance in Summer Nights, the best song from the movie adaptation of the Broadway musical Grease, Asked and Answered. A men this topic is closed but there are many more topics to discuss so please reach out to us on twitter at we got this tweets or you can email us at we got this podcast at gmail.com or why don't you go to our facebook group share your olivia newton john and grease memories were you in a production what songs did you enjoy singing what songs do you enjoy from the soundtrack that you want to discuss more that's the place to do it facebook.com slash group slash we got this podcast thank you to producer ken plume the grease in our lightning who you can support by going to patreon.com slash Ken Plume and listening and watching all of the wonderful things he's creating on the reg. Also, thank you to researcher Kate McManus, graphic designer Uri Kelman and QA engineer Jen Alba. And thanks, of course, to our musicians, Jonathan Dinerstein and Mike Furman for our score and theme song, respectively. And thanks to you, the people of the world, for giving us an opportunity to sit down and talk about Olivia Newton-John and Greece. You know, we got this with Mark and Hal and the people of the world go together like Rama Lama Lama Kading a Dinga Dong. Ting Tang. Remembered forever like Shubop Shuwada Wada Yippity Boom Boom. Ting Tang. Harry Orangutan. That's the way it should be. Wow yeah. For Hal Loveland, I'm Mark Gagliardi. For Mark Gagliardi, I'm Hal Loveland. <laughs> That's so dumb. For Mark Gagliardi, I'm Hal Lublin, and don't worry, everybody. We got this. We got this! MaximumFun.org Comedy and culture. Artist owned, audience supported.